me CB Sunset. Uh, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm joined on stage by a writer and star of many a cracked video, my occasional co-host, Mr. Michael Swain. Uh, Michael, you look well. Thank you. Well, I thought I should take our role pretty seriously today. We're going to yeah. be doing some judging. Yeah, today we're talking about badasses that you've likely never heard of either due to an acute case of not being a straight white guy. Uh, history hates it when you're not a straight white guy. Uh, or because they were on the losing side of the war or had stupid names. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of reasons you've never heard of these people, but they're all going to be incredibly entertainingly badass. And Michael and I are going to sit here in judgment. Uh, so yeah, here's the format. Uh, we're gonna bring out one of our writers who will present badasses for our approval, uh, like a female baboon, except rather than being swollen and red, the asses they present will be underregarded and bad. Uh, you will then... really work to make that metaphor <laughs> connect. I'm I, proud of you. Off I'm the top proud of my you. head. That's, uh, you'll then indicate your approval. Let's get to our first uh, presenter. Uh, he is a hilarious stand-up writer and performer from Cracked. Uh, he enters every room he walks into first. Please welcome Alex Schmidt. Yeah. Hi, Alex. I want to talk about, um, I'm going to call him Tisquantum, because that's what he called himself. Uh, but you know him as Squanto. Uh, and uh, he's, I think, one of the most famous Native Americans, if not just figures in history, and he's famous for none of the cool stuff for some reason. He basically, like, we know him as, oh, he was good at corn, but, like, actually, <laughs> he, he lived, he basically lived the life of a Game of Thrones character. He was born in uh, present day Massachusetts in a village called Patuxet, uh, and he was, so his, he spent his childhood being raised to be an advisor to the chiefs, and what that meant in their culture was, all kinds of just like punishing trials. And John Smith came to his uh, village in 1614 and uh, visited and kind of got to know the tribe. And John Smith went off to another place and left behind one of his guys and said, you know, just uh, keep talking to these people and keep an eye on them. And uh, his uh, subordinate said, yes, absolutely. But then kidnapped like two dozen natives, including uh, Tisquantum, who also, we, uh, as far as his name goes in the historical record, we know that's what he told the British his name was, but in their language, it translates to Wrath of God. So he might have just made up a cool persona for him, so. <laughs> that's is, your act break right there. What's your name, son? Wrath of God. And, uh, and yeah, and that's, so under his awesome Wrath of God name, he spent the next five years uh, in hell. The unscrupulous British guy who kidnapped him uh, took him away and immediately brought him to Spain to be sold into slavery. Uh, he managed to talk his way out of slavery in presumably a language he just learned, so good job. Uh, and then got, worked his way to England where he was a servant but also basically a house pet for a very rich British man who just wanted to be like, oh, Native American, look at that, uh, in his house. And then he talked his way out of that, presumably in a new language, and uh, got a ride on a boat to Newfoundland. Then he talked to a guy there, said, hey, I'd really like to go back to Massachusetts. And the guy was like, yeah, sure, let's just go back and forth again across the Atlantic again. So he was on four horrible cross-Atlantic voyages, and then five years later gets back to his old hometown of Patuxet, and everyone is dead. Everyone, 90% of the population in Massachusetts died of some kind of viral hepatitis. And so what used to be his village of Patuxet was now the English colony of Plymouth that they built on top of it. And everyone he's known in his life is gone. And none of the natives trust uh, Tisquantum because he's been too close to the Europeans, you know, because they kidnapped him and stuff. Uh, and none of the Europeans trust his quantum because he's a Native American. And so what he does is play everyone against everyone for the rest of his life. When he returned, like, they were living in the houses of the people who had oh, died, yeah. like, just, like, using their bowls. They were like, <laughs> uh, oh, <laughs> hey, uh, hey, man. 
Yeah, I think he really, and I, I mentioned Game of Thrones because he really had, one of the things I love about that show is you'll just constantly see characters like, well, I'm in a new continent and everything's bad. And it just, <laughs> it just happens to him all the time where he's like, I guess I need to learn a whole other language and uh, convince people I'm the greatest again. All right, <laughs> shall we confer? Does Alex beat <laughs> nobody? <laughs> yeah, I think he can stay out here for now. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. I'm a presenter goes by many names. Uh, the Surge, Serge, uh, Sarge, Party Weasel is a new one. Uh, he's a hilarious writer, performer, and cracked columnist. Joshua F. Sargent. Oh, look at those elbow patches. I was talking about this earlier. I saw, I don't remember when, as a kid, I saw someone wearing elbow patches, and I just said, that's what adulthood and success looks like. <laughs> My guy, Aki Ra, or Akira, is still around because history happens every day and is still alive, <laughs> which is important to remember. Um, he was born, uh, he doesn't actually know when. It was in the early 70s in Cambodia. And the reason he doesn't know when is because the Khmer Rouge, uh, before he was old enough to have memories, killed his family and made him a slave uh, planting landmines because uh, little tiny baby hands are the best hands for planting landmines, which is a horribly depressing thing that you now know because of Pol Pot. Uh, he did that for about 10 years, and then the Khmer Rouge was in a battle with the Vietnamese army that freed Aki Ra and immediately had him plant landmines for them, <laughs> which I imagine was disappointing. <laughs> in 1989, the Vietnamese army left Cambodia, which I'm sure you already knew, and the Cambodian government came in and said, look, Sorry, one person in the audience is like, what? <laughs> Uh, Cambodian army came up and said, you know, you've been really good at planting landmines. How about you keep doing that? And he's like, we're not at war, but okay. <laughs> and he kept doing that until 1992, when finally the UN came in and asked him to help them remove landmines. <laughs> you know, they left, job done. He said, well, we still have more landmines in Cambodia than people. There are six million unexploded landmines in Cambodia, 5.1 million people. So what he did is he spent that point in 1994 until now digging up landmines. And what's impressive about this is that, for context, when the UN shifts landmines, is what you call it, they have a team of 1,000 people, and in a month, they can remove 3,000 landmines using state-of-the-art equipment and training and state-of-the-art, those two little things. Little baby those two things. You told us. Yeah. <laughs> Tiny little, little hands. UN. Robot baby hands. <laughs> Akira, between 1994 and 2005, using a pocket knife and occasionally a wrench and no other equipment, literally a t-shirt and pants, removed 50,000 landmines. Now, today, he uh, is still doing that. He has a uh, landmine museum that he runs that is full of landmines that he has... You gotta seen. put them somewhere. Yeah, he's, he's turning them, them up. Turn them into non-bombs <laughs> to show tourists and people uh, to pay for his continued efforts. And he also is, it serves as a home for children who've been injured by landmines. Because again, the entire country is just <laughs> landmines in villages yeah. and farms, which what, you might yeah. notice is where people live and grow food. Uh, is that it? That's, that, is that it? Yes, that's all. That's, <laughs> that's all. that's all he's that's done. That's all that, that guy's done. very impressive, great. and I believe I heard some audible gasps yeah. from the crowd. <laughs> Let's stick with Akira. Let's, uh, Akira replaces Squanto. Uh, who sucks, clearly. Uh, no. <laughs> well, Alex, but like, he plants mines, and then he takes apart mines. That's like one skill. It's a zero-sum game. <laughs> and it's a zero-sum game, right? It kind of just cancels out. Oh, Alex's wanna... reign ended so quickly. Get out of here, Alex, you're done. <laughs> you're done in this town. And Alex always exits caught last. <laughs> oh, I was too late with the bit. He didn't do it. Who are we bringing out? We're bringing out uh, Blake Wexler, a hilarious stand-up who has worked on many of my favorite shows like uh, Key and Peele and Review. Uh, he's a regular on the Todd Glass show, the Nerds Podcast. Please give it up for Blake Wexler. Blake Wexler! Blake Wexler! Blake. Hey, Blake. Thank you for having me. I am... Um... Uh, not I, this is not about me. I'm the badass. Uh, uh, in 1777, 
uh, George Washington's army was camped out in, uh, in Valley Forge, which is in uh, uh, suburban Philadelphia. And there was probably 12,000 troops that he had under his command. 2,000 that year died. So it was looking real bad. And they hadn't uh, won a single battle yet against the British. Um, Meanwhile, in Prussia, uh, Frederick the Great had uh, released um, a man named Baron von Steuben from his army. And that's the guy. That's my badass, Baron von Steuben. And he was released uh, for being gay. And that's why he was released, which, by the way, is what I want on my tombstone, is that here lies Blake Wexler. He was fired from the Prussian army for being gay. It's the most <laughs> baller thing I've ever heard in my entire life. It's awesome. So he gets kicked out, and uh, Benjamin Franklin, like amidst having sex with numerous French whores, was like, oh, this guy is awesome. We need to get this guy. <laughs> we totally need to get this guy. So Baron von Steuben gets uh, not flown over. <laughs> he, he probably he hopped on the back of an Franklin eagle, and that's why it's so machine. cool. Yeah, a gorgeous, beautiful, plumaged eagle. Um, I would imagine it was a boat uh, that he got on. And... Um, so meanwhile, Valley Forge, uh, the uh, Connell Army is camped out. Morale is horribly low. No one even has shoes. You know, people are losing limbs to frostbite, like, by the hour. And then all of a sudden, there's a noise in the distance. And it's like, it sounds like bottles clinking together. And then over a hill, Baron von Steuben uh, arriving at this ragtag army. The noise, it was uh, a bunch of jingle bells that he had affixed to a, a gorgeous, immaculately constructed sleigh. My man pulled up in a goddamn sleigh. <laughs> a sleigh. And... <laughs> He was wearing a huge fur coat. These people don't even have shirts. He shows up in a fur coat while petting a miniature greyhound. <laughs> which, like, he, he invented the dog accessory, which is pretty cool. So, and on his sleigh, sleigh, again, sleigh, he has uh, his chief of staff, not that odd, and then four of his young gay boyfriends. And it's just like, that's a entrance. That's a hell of a f***ing entrance. So he rolls up, doesn't speak a word of goddamn English. And it's just like, I, 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 and just like, trains the s*** out of the army. These people didn't even know how to fix bayonets to a, to a f***ing musket, which I would imagine, rope? I don't know. But they didn't even know how to do it. And he teaches that. He teaches battle formations. He, uh, he teaches how to, um, a new efficient way of, um, roading and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, loading and reloading. And, um, the first battle after uh, the encampment of Valley Forge um, had ended was the first battle in the, uh, throughout the war that um, the Americans actually held the battleground. So it turned the entire tide of the world, uh, the war. He turned the tide. Uh, he turned farmers, literally farmers and lawyers, into professional killers, all the while wearing a fur coat and parading around with his little gay horse. Like he was the <laughs> sh. If that's not the most baller <laughs> badass, I don't know what. What's wrong with you? He was amazing. Give it up for Baron von Mother Stoyman, everybody. Please, that's all I have. Good hype, man. Did Pretty good. Awesome. Yeah. Did this I'm ready for von Stoyman to come out and start oh, like, laying down tracks. His dead body just drops from the ceiling and it's just like Very a in that right style. down. Yeah. Like, did this more of a bummer or? than. I'm it sounds like he also invented Santa Claus. Like, it really. <laughs> Or didn't it feel like yeah. he was leaning towards, and right. Coca-Cola was there, and they were like, yeah. Yeah. that guy will sell coats. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> truly a badass. Also, I think for the added layer of getting it to come down in history, his true sexual orientation, you know what I mean? Because yeah. there are many historical figures who may well have been gay, but it's such a triumph to have history allow that to be remembered about you. Yeah, and he was so, like, <laughs> shamelessly himself, you know, like... That in, they couldn't, yeah. In terms of, like, the most homophobic arenas of the world, it's, like, the army and then suburban Philadelphia. Like, those are one and two. <laughs> and he served openly and proudly. Yeah, he was awesome. I think we should do a plasmeter. Plasmeter. All right. Uh, let's go von Steuben. Or Steuben or Steuben. Or Steuben. Okay. Akira. <laughs> All right. Run, Blake. Well, that was an amazing Blake disappearance. Blake is a great at reading a crowd, isn't he? Uh, our next presenter is a regular contributor to The Onion, uh, 
and he's a stand-up uh, known for producing a conceptual comedy show, uh, one called Seven Minutes in Purgatory, which I watched on YouTube, which is definitely worth your time, uh, where comedians perform in one room for a camera with noise-canceling headphones uh, while the audience watches in another, so the comedian has no idea how they're doing and just, like, <laughs> dies a slow death. Uh, it's really brilliant. Uh, with that in mind, please make very little noise to avoid startling Mr. Ian Abramson. <laughs> yeah, the door sticks. I'd hate it if you guys made a lot of noise. Wow, okay. <laughs> How we doing? So, I don't know if you guys have heard of P.T. Barnum. I assume that on some level you have. You think circus guy, you might think liar, cheat. I think red-blooded American. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, we stole this country is what I'm saying, and what better example than a man that built his, uh, built his career on lying and cheating. Um, that said, he did it in a very honest way. Uh, <laughs> as a child, um, P.T. Barnum was completely tricked, and this kind of set the tone of his entire life. Uh, he was told, um, as like an infant, um, to the time that he was about 12 years old, that he in had inherited land from his uncle. And uh, not realizing that this was kind of some kind of an in-joke with his family, people would just kind of be like, don't worry, when, you're, when you come of age, you'll be inheriting Ivy Island. Uh, Ivy Island is basically just a completely useless swamp. So he kind of continues his life. He ends up becoming a shop owner. And uh, he, he's always had a kind of a penchant for excitement and kind of heightening the stakes, so he starts a lottery. And this did not exist in America before that, so he kind of had a part in starting the first lottery at his shop. And because that was controversial, he got some bad reviews, so then he started his own newspaper. Uh, which also allowed him to legitimately call out um, other frauds in newsprint, which got him arrested three different times. He moves to New York and he says, I need to find the next big thing, what am I going to do? And uh, he, he hears about in Washington, D.C., someone claims to have George Washington's nurse, the woman that says, uh, she says that she changed George Washington's diaper. He has no money and he has to figure out, uh, even if I sell everything I have, how am I going to, to, uh, to do this? How am I gonna get the money to buy um, this, this woman? Because slavery still exists at this point, again, time of Abraham Lincoln. And they, uh, they, they, he says, you know what? I have one thing I can put down as collateral. It's a family heirloom, Ivy Island. <laughs> and uh, this woman would have been, I think, over 200 years old. <laughs> well over 200 years old, and, uh, and so there's no way that that was true. And he must have known that, but to, the, to his dying day, he claims to have been fooled by it himself. That's the thing with PT, good old PT. He, he was touring with George Washington's wet nurse, and what she would do is you would come in to like a big kind of conference hall. She would just kind of sing songs that she claimed to have sung for Abraham Lincoln. Um, and Lincoln or Washington? See, Great your story's catch. not even... <laughs> that would have been my first clue. This I, met, right I met Nixon. And I sang this to Elvis Presley a hundred years from now. You Science. love liars. You love fraud. <laughs> and so does America. <laughs> USA! USA! Awesome. All right, let's go. P.T. Barnum. <laughs> Someone literally <laughs> made the, like, I'm ambivalent noise. It was fine. Akira. Thank you, Ian. Our next presenter is a hilarious writer, performer, and columnist uh, for Cracked, uh, Mr. Thomas Ryman. <laughs> Excellent sitcom neighbor entrance. <laughs> uh, you guys really dropped the ball, not all going, oh. Have you guys seen The Raid? Yeah. Uh, Raid Redemption. Or, Excellent. Check it out. Or its sequel. The Raid 2. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, Rama Sukana was the lady who invented uh, the fighting style that's used in those movies. It's called Penchak uh, Silat. Um, you look at us like we could correct you <laughs> if you said it wrong. Yeah. Oh, Am Penchak I pronouncing Silat. it correctly, everyone? That's, yeah. 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 Sounds Someone harder. just leaps yeah. down, stabs you, and <laughs> elbows yeah. you in the face. If you haven't seen it, The Raid is about a bunch of Indonesian uh, stuntmen beating each other to death in a series of hallways. <laughs> Um, 
it is fantastic. It's the yeah. best movie ever. It truly is. Um, so a uh, lady actually invented that fighting style, and she's kind of like a, a legendary character. There's not a whole lot of like real actual facts about her, except everyone agrees that it was this one lady. Um, and the story goes that she's walking down to the river or whatever to do the laundry for the day, and you can tell how old it is because she's carrying her laundry on her head. Right. And she's walking down to do the laundry in the river, like you do, um, and she sees the, uh, according to different versions of the legend, I'm gonna stick with this one first, she sees two monkeys fighting. One of them is attacking the other one with a stick. So she's watching as this monkey is trying to beat the hell out of this other monkey with a stick, and, and the, the stickless monkey is doing this like dramatic series of getting the hell out of the way and like dazzling <laughs> hand moves, like swatting it away, and just really just avoiding every bit of um, assault that this stick monkey, we will call it, <laughs> is uh, unleashing. And she sits there, it's just transfixed by this, as any one of us would be, right? If that right. was a YouTube video. Just yeah. put that on TV. Right. That yeah. should have been the raid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 90 minutes of monkeys beating each other to death. <laughs> the stick monkey, too. Right. <laughs> it gets really late. She's like, oh, crap, I get it. better get back to my house. Her husband has been sitting at home this entire time wondering when the hell Rama is going to come back with his laundry and also with his dinner. What a dick. Right. <laughs> oh, it gets this guy. Like, because he can't, he, he can't eat his dinner unless he's wearing a clean tunic, so both of those chores have to be done at the same time. So she gets back to his house, and he immediately sets into her with trying to beat the hell out of her for being late. So she sees him coming at her, just with this, um, you know, in full, where's my dinner bitch mode. <laughs> and is trying to hit her, but she's like, oh no, I just watched these monkeys, so I know what to do. So she just lays into what the other monkey was doing to avoid the stick move, you know, like some dazzling hand moves and deft head right. bobs and weaves, and he just cannot land a single blow. And this goes on until he gets tired. <laughs> Finally, it gets to the point where he's just like, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> what is this? What is this? What is this that you... What sorcery have you brought into this house? And she tells him what it is, and then it becomes Penchak Silat. Now, what do you mean she tells him what it is? Does it have a name that she... Yeah, no, or she, does shows, she say... She uh, demonstrates it to him. Okay. Right. So is it, it's I mean, safe it's, to assume that she then began... Like honing it into a codified yeah, yeah. system she of She demonstrated what she had learned from this monkey. It's unclear where the monkey himself learned it. I assume he picked it up. I saw he picked it up in prison. This I, has all I the hallmarks of the true story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I thought, again, like I said, it's steeped in legend, but every every version of it pretty much agrees that it's this one lady who came up with it. However, she came up with it. Right. That's my pick. Is Give us that name Rama, one more time again. Rama Sukana. My man Jack's gonna have to say yeah. it right now. You don't think I could remember? <laughs> Rama Sukana. There you go. Are we bored of Akira yet? Akira. <laughs> Rama Sukana. Well done. Nicely done, sir. Up next is the newest full-time member of the crack team, a hilarious writer, performer, and actress. She has a cat that pees magic crystals, is something we learned at the last live show, uh, and many tattoos that are themselves cooler than me. Please give it up for Carmen Angelica. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, Ching Shi, the most successful pirate captain of all time. Woo! This is my opinion. Um, and, your opinion. and also, my opinion is fact. Um, oh, by the way, uh, she was a woman. Um, <laughs> born in 1785, became a prostitute to survive, was born into poverty, um, married Captain Zhong Yi. I looked up how to pronounce that, so I don't totally Ooh. butcher everything. Um, leader of the Red Flag Fleet of Pirates. Pretty scary at the time. Pretty scary Still pirates. Still scary, yeah. And then in 1807, Xiong Yi died in a tsunami, and uh, she did not <laughs> die in the tsunami. Badass! Because she's a badass. They were both in the tsunami? Yeah. That is bad. And she lived. <laughs> she cool, lived. Man. He she died. She surfed him point <laughs> break like, style <laughs> away from the tsunami. She like, surfed his body. <laughs> she like she like stands up. She boy that was some tsunami, huh? And then she's like, oh. She's like, honey, did you feel that? Oh no. 
<laughs> oh, all right. And then because he died, uh, there were a ton of uh, male pirates who were uh, up for the throne. And she was like, no, 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 I'm in charge now. Um, so she became in charge of the fleet, and it became the biggest um, pirate fleet, uh, one of the biggest pirate fleets ever, bigger than a lot of navies. Um, she took over every single major pirate organization. Um, she ended up with 1,800 ships and 80,000 pirates that she was in charge of. Damn. I know. <laughs> a murmur sweeps through the I crowd. I know. 80,000 Get pirates. into it with me. This is great. Um, not only that, okay, but she organized um, an inland spy network. Um, she had protection schemes. She had. Uh, she was blackmailing people. She was the Godfather. <laughs> Before the Godfather, or, or any of the people that the Godfather was based off of, she was the original. Are we sure she didn't pay the tsunami? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I believe actually the tsunami paid her to have it ride it. <laughs> you know. Um, it's hot. That's hot. That's pretty hot. Oh yeah. She was that badass. Um, uh, she also had a very strict moral code as a pirate. She would chop off the heads of anyone who broke the rules, <laughs> and um, she would also chop off the ears of anybody who deserted. Uh, I don't know why that was a lesser offense. Yeah, you're saying it's uh, so like you said deserved it. She was like, she, like that's a pretty ambiguous moral code. It's such an open like, ended. You and you, yeah. you're cool. I think it was like I think she was like maybe they didn't hear me well enough when I said you can't leave. So next time I'm gonna cut off your ears so that you just have a hole that my words go straight into. Um, and she made sure that no women were mistreated. If they captured any women, they had to be released unless the male pirate and the lady who was stolen um, was like, uh, oh, I like you, oh, I like you too, let's get married. And then they both had to agree, and then they could get married, but if he cheated, she would kill him. <laughs> so nobody on, everybody was very faithful in her pirate troops. Um, then the Chinese government was like, oh, she's too good at this. Oh, she's... Stealing all our things. We can't do this alone. Um, sick, sick Chinese government. Yeah. Right yeah. Um, and then they were like, uh, so they organized an imperial fleet, and they were like, uh, hey, British, Dutch. And the British and Dutch were like, okay, we'll help you. Uh, and, then, <laughs> and then they did, and then she met them head on. She didn't turn around. She didn't even like warp around them. Like She was like, she met them head on and took 60 imperial ships with her. She took 60 of them. And then the Chinese admiral killed himself because he was like, I don't want her to capture me. Damn. Um, so then the Chinese government was like, we don't know what to do, peace. And so they offered her a peace treaty. Um, and, every and she was like, only if uh, every pirate was pardoned and allowed uh, to retire unpunished, and they got to keep all the loot that they stole. Um, and then uh, she was like, my husband needs to be the new head of the Navy, because um, the, guy, the guy before killed himself. Um, was her husband a fellow pirate, or did oh, she, she capture she, someone and then marry him? No, she took a, she was, it, she like, was like, I think when she became the pi head of the pirates, she was like, you. You're my husband. You are my um, concubine. And then, and then he was like, Checks okay. Um, yeah, you don't want to know what she's going to chop off if you refuse that. Yeah. <laughs> so then, so then he was, she was like, he gets to be the head of the Navy because I scared the head of the Navy so much he killed himself. And then, um, and then she was like, but I'm done. Uh, and so she's like, but you can make me a noble lady. So she was like, a la she was considered the lady of imperial decree. And she died in 1844 at the age of 69. <laughs> well, now, you just put me over the top. I'm sold yeah. now. She, Up to that point. Uh, Ching Shi. Thank you, thank, thank you guys for coming out. Really thank thank you. you. Hi everyone, thank you for watching that video. I'm not gonna tell you to like or subscribe because you're obviously varsity at YouTube by now. It's been out for long enough that you know how this all works. Uh, you can always comment, of course you, you know that too. You can pretty much do whatever you want. You can just wait for this to end and for the next video to load because you know there's autoplay now, although I don't know in the future if YouTube will continue to do that. 
obviously the more that I talk, the, the less chance there is that you'll be able to advance to the next video because there's so much time that I'm taking up right now. You should probably actually just pick something from the rail next to me. It's a lot easier.